Hi there, everybody. I am Dr. Sam, and welcome to our home office. I've decided that I wanted to kind of <clears throat> come on and talk about some of the things that I've been using throughout this lengthy quarantine to sort of keep my own sanity. Today we're going to be talking about something that I was incredibly resistant to starting. Um, I'm talking way before quarantine, um, probably going back to like 2014. <clears throat> so in chiropractic school, as you might imagine, much like other healthcare professions, um, people are borderline frantically obsessed with the pursuit of health. And so as a product, people get into like weird diets, they get into like strange supplementation, they're doing like weird things with their water, they're doing weird workouts. Um, and I mean, you can be skeptical if you want, but I think the coolest thing about that is like, what I've learned is that someone's always going to come into you and they're going to say, have you heard of this? Because I love it. And you can be like, yeah, I've heard of that. That's pretty awesome. Um, and so when I was in chiropractic school, the things that were probably most popular were keto, which I did, um, ferments. So like making your own sauerkraut, making your own kimchi. I freaking love kimchi. It's probably one of my favorite things ever. Um, I don't eat it as often as I used to, but man, is it good, especially when it's like super spicy. Um, sourdoughs, um, oh, kombucha was like huge. So I was very resistant to those things because in my mind, just kind of a little bit of background for you. I'm from the South. And so I was raised to think, and I hope, I suspect that most families in the South don't think this, but here we are. I'm telling my story. I was raised to believe that like anything less than like medium well done was going to give you a foodborne illness, that like runny egg yolks were going to kill you, um, sushi was going to kill you and give you brain parasites, which apparently isn't far off from true, but like not very likely um, that like anything that wasn't charred to a crisp was going to give you some sort of intestinal disease. Um, so yeah, that's sort of my background. And so I've always been really resistant to doing any sort of fermented item. Ironically, not because of the theoretical alcohol production, but really because I didn't want to get sick. Um, and then um Call it what you will. I have like I've actually had many conversations about whether fermented food items are vegan or not because it's mostly well, it's a lot of bacteria. Um, I'm happy that ve most vegans do not consider fermented items to be uh, animal products because fermented foods are really really good for you. So <clears throat> I still do. I'm still very resistant to making my own sauerkraut, which means I pay an exorbitant amount of money for like the not commercial, but found in like the natural food store sauerkraut. And then I'll go through it in like a week and then not buy it again for a couple more weeks or months. Um, <clears throat> but so with sourdough, the thing that always pr gave me a lot of anxiety was that I didn't want someone to give me a starter because starters tend to be, um, aged. And that, I mean, there's a lot of, um, controversy on whether the age of a mother really matters. A mother is our starter. Um, I tend to think that the older starters are cooler. I mean, they have a tradition. They've passed through many hands. You know, it's, it's kind of cool. Um, and just the idea of someone giving me something that's like 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years old, um, really, it just freaked me out. Like, what if I kill it? So, <clears throat> strangely enough, um, amidst the toilet paper fiasco of 2020, which I hope to God in a few years when someone else is watching this, they're going to be like, what the hell is she talking about? The toilet paper fiasco. Um, but <laughs> earlier this year during the toilet paper fiasco, um, there was a, a much less noted but still significant shortage of yeast. I don't know why. I don't know how. Um... It's a little bit ironic, but for some reason, like mid-February, I just, I was like, I think I want to start baking. And I bought an entire like jar full of yeast. I'll come back to why that's funny in a little bit. 
But I, I, you know, I baked my, I bake some uh, braided bread and which I love to do a couple of times a year. And, um, and I just kind of went on with life and I didn't think very much about it. So in comes coronavirus. Um, our office stayed open the entire time. We had a little bit of a dip at a certain point, but things recovered very quickly. And we've really been just trying to meet the needs of our community for as long as possible. So essentially with that role, like in the chiropractic world, we do have a bit of a different relationship than you would have with like a primary care provider or with your um, medical doctor. And the reason that is like super simple. I mean, you can put personalities aside, you can put like intentions and conversations aside. We just see people more frequently, at least hopefully, um, more than a person sees their medical doctor. So therefore we really have the opportunity to get to know someone a little better. And with that, as a blessing as that is, um, what will happen is through the peaks and troughs of a person's emotional stability and emotional um, response to everything we've been dealing with in the past, you know, six months now, um, we are empathetic. We tend to carry that after that patient leaves, after the tears are shed, after the fear is just expelled. Um, when that patient leaves, we kind of carry that with us. And so historically, what we would do is my husband and I would travel. So we would go on weekend trips. Um, we would just get out of town for a little bit. And that's not exactly been very easy to do since coronavirus started. Um, and so I was kind of left with this feeling, this need to sort of detach from the stresses of work, to detach from the stresses of knowing that my child is not getting really any social interaction at all, um, and really kind of trying to find something that gave me peace and made me feel good about myself. Um, so actually that's going to be what all of these are about, like things that I have done during coronavirus that have made me feel better. So, um, in the middle of June, I guess it was the beginning of June, I was at, uh, I was actually doing a pickup from one of our friends who was giving something to Teddy and she was like, I put something in a jar for you. And I got there and I immediately knew that it was a starter. And this person's starter is about 35 years old. And I literally just, I was like, I could just leave this here. I can make it look like an accident. <laughs> I don't have to take this with me. Um, but I did. So I brought it home with me and it was in a tiny little jar. So I immediately moved it to a bigger jar and I became, I felt like a new mother. I watched it all the time. A little break there. Um, I watched it all the time. I ended up joining a Facebook group about keeping it alive. I was texting this friend probably three or four times a day. I just didn't want it to die. I didn't even care about making bread yet. Like that was just not on my mind. I was just get this guy active and let's see what happens. I'm here to tell you that keeping a starter alive is incredibly easy. So this is the context by which I would encourage you if you're thinking about getting into sourdough, like kind of keep this tucked in your back pocket. There's actually a really cool um, book I don't remember the name of it, but essentially it is a cookbook that is a, like a combination of recipes from Alaskan pioneers, meaning like 130 years ago, 150 years ago, when people explored from the continental United States through Canada into Alaska, they had sourdough with them. And these people kept their sourdough alive. So it can't be that hard. I imagine wagon living is hard enough. You're not going to have some delicate little thing in your wagon that you have to take care of. I mean, I guess babies count. But I would say on top of all the responsibilities of staying alive, a sourdough starter with a huge responsibility is probably not one of those things. So my two weeks goes by. Um, it's recommended that you let it get nice and stable before you bake. And so I made my first bowl and I never looked back. I became obsessed. I was cooking a lot of sourdough, way too much sourdough at a certain point, like four a week. And that's, that's too much for me personally, because my husband doesn't really eat it. And my son loves it, but he doesn't eat the crust. And it's like a whole thing. I end up always throwing some away. So I've slowed down and I probably cook it like once or twice a week. And my obsession for the past two to three weeks has been 
um, avocado toast. So I've started making it in a loaf, a nice smaller square. Um, but I'll tell you, you know, you, you do start to get creative with it. Like a lot of times when someone picks up a hobby, they want, they want their hobby to, they want to get like perfect. They want to make it the best ever. And because the sourdough was so easy or the starter was so easy to keep alive, my first reaction was, okay, how far can I take this in the wrong direction and still get bread out of it? Right. So, um, I did, I use a scale, um, and I use a very simple recipe where I don't have to knead it or anything, but I do. Sometimes I add too much water. Sometimes I don't add enough salt. Sometimes I add too much salt. Sometimes I make it really, really dry. Sometimes I make it really, really moist. Um, and I just like let it go and let it do its own thing. And I'll tell you, I've only thrown out two bowls in like probably 40 to 50 loaves. Um, and one of them wasn't really the sourdough's fault. I thought the starter was active and it wasn't. Um, and the other one was because I left the oven at 550 for an hour <laughs> instead of 450. So essentially what I'm trying to say is that I thought sourdough was going to be this like huge responsibility. And I thought much like everything else in my life, I thought that if I started doing it, that I had it, I had it to be perfect. Um, and now I know that that's just not true. Um, it's been a really beautiful practice for me. It's something that I get to do before my son wakes up. Um, and it's really, it gives me a lot of peace. I'm thinking about starting to add in some herbs and add in some cheeses and stuff, but right now I'm obsessed with my avocado toast and my poached egg. So um, I'm probably going to continue doing these. I'm probably going to talk about um, a couple of services that I've started. Um, but this one was like the easiest. This is straightforward, doesn't get any cheaper than this. Thanks, guys.